So today I will speak about uh, uh, caribou and development in West Central Alberta and uh, uh, Eastern BC. I will not put any emphasis now on bear predation, despite what was my intention in the beginning, simply because we already had two talks about bears, so you get the point. And plus, believe it or not, we're also friends. Uh, we know each other, we collaborate, we empower each other, we, we try to complement instead of uh, overlapping. So my emphasis might be on, uh, on, on caribou itself, a little, a little bit on wolves still, uh, uh, but not on bears. Uh, say this, I want to again echo, echo what was said uh, before, that uh, yes, uh, caribou mortality uh, is not just due to wolves, and uh, I'm of the opinion, which is supported by some uh, information, that uh, bears are also playing an important contributing role to uh, caribou mortality. But again, this is normal in an interconnected ecosystem, and uh, these pieces, all of them, uh, Jason's uh, deer, Gord's uh, grizzly, the plants and forests that we were describing before, they all belong to the same food web, so these links are obvious. I had uh, a number of projects uh, uh, in the past, but mainly uh, three uh, big projects. And uh, uh, they all interconnected. And today I will focus only on what was delivered by these projects in 2014. Why? Because I was here last year and the year before, so I want to repeat the information already uh, uh, given. Um, say this, uh, like Gord has done, it's important to uh, tell that uh, I started working on Caribou in 2007 and uh, uh, this was already funded uh, uh, by, uh, by CAP and uh, uh, the project was on linear features, forestry and wolf predation of caribou uh, and other uh, prey in West Central Alberta. So the emphasis is West Central. Um, and th this project ran from 2007 to 2010. Then in 2011 and to, through 13, we were focusing on the role of predation in woodland caribou decline more specifically. Um, and in 2014, we didn't have any funding, zero, which is a good opportunity to stop and think. <laughs> um, uh, some funding came through NSERC. Anybody doesn't know what NSERC is? Raise your hands. Okay, so NSERC is the body that funds academic uh, uh, research uh, uh, on scientific and engineering matter uh, in Canada. Are you from Canada? Yes, I mean, uh, doesn't matter. Either way, if you pay taxes, you are giving some money to me uh, through your tax contribution and the uh, objective of funding good research. Um, so the title of the project is a bit uh, mm -hmm. sciencey, like you would expect for an NSERC funding. Uh, this is a, a five-year funding, and it is on developing multivariate approaches to analyze ecological variation in caribou. Either way, I want to say I have an emphasis on uh, biodiversity uh, within the species too. And this links back to what Gord mentioned, that uh, we don't want just to save caribou, we would like to save the healthy uh, uh, caribou and the healthy environment, which also implies that we want to uh, maintain the biodiversity within the species. It's important here to mention that uh, I have had for, the, for years now a uh, uh, co-PI who is Mark Hebelwhite of the University of Montana. And uh, uh, also these three publications are that I'm uh, uh, talking about today that uh, were published in uh, 2014, they relate to uh, work of uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows um, and uh, I will focus on one, a paper on genetic diversity in uh, caribou linked to past and future climate change. Now, this was uh, uh, published in a prestigious journal called, called Nature uh, Climate Change. You know, just as a side note, here I want to mention that in academia we are very competitive. So we use uh, an impact factor to determine what is the reputation of a journal. This impact factor 
is linked to how much that journal is read on a global scale uh, by uh, academics. And uh, Nature Climate Change is one of the best journals. Um, the other paper is led by uh, Nick, uh, I say De Cesare because I'm born in Italy, but I don't know how you would say, De Caesar. Okay, Nick De Caesar. <laughs> Uh, he's of course, he's of course uh, not Italian, okay? Uh, 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 and so he will say Nick de Caesar too, but I say de Cesare, let me please. Um, and uh, um, it is uh, about uh, uh, linking habitat selection and prediction risk to spatial variation in survival of caribou. And um, the last paper that I want to mention, also published in uh, 2014, uh, is about identifying non-independent anthropogenic risks using a behavioral individual based model for caribou again. Here you see that uh, a number of us in academia gather caribou and reindeer sample throughout the planet. This species is one species, reindeer and caribou is the same species and it has a so-called holarctic uh, distribution. Now the land is great here. You see there's North America, there's Asia, and there is Europe too. So we got uh, uh, samples throughout North America and Eurasia uh, for uh, uh, caribou and reindeer, and um, we tested uh, how many groups we have. And of course, any of you will say, yes, of course, we have two groups. We have reindeer and we have caribou. And that is largely confirmed, but you didn't know, perhaps, uh, that uh, in North America we have reindeer too. Did you know? OK, so let me say that uh, making a generalization, what we call tundra caribou, or barren ground caribou, is not caribou, it's reindeer. This was somehow known before the study, but what was not known is that in Canada, for example, we are dealing with two major types of caribou or subspecies of caribou. One is the northern type of caribou, which is closer again to reindeer, and the other one is the southern type of caribou. Now, the southern type of caribou here is blue, and the northern type of caribou is red, right? And the most interesting aspect is that in West Central Alberta or in the Southern Rockies, it's a transitional zone. We have genetically two types of caribou, you see? And this was confirmed using um, nuclear DNA as well as mitochondrial DNA and some complex uh, clustering uh, uh, statistics. And also when you plot this uh, uh, diversity, this is what you get. You get a big cloud of the so northern type of caribou and reindeer, and a big blue cloud of the southern. And again, in the southern Rockies, or in West Central Alberta, we are here in the middle. So it's a transitional snow, uh, zone with hybrid characteristics. Now, again, all these results have been published in the best journals of the field. One is called Molecular Ecology, the other one is called Nature Climate Change. And basically, we have two lineages of caribou and reindeer, the red one and the blue one. And again, in our areas, we have both types of DNA. This you will find in, the, in, the, in today's document. So it just repeats that. Uh, Note that at a global scale, Alberta and BC caribou are unique and a unique blend of two major caribou reindeer lineages. Now, why did it get published on uh, nature climate change? It's because we were working at uh, uh, a climate change uh, level. We went back to uh, 21,000 years ago and we modeled the relationship between the caribou distribution and climate, and we found that very likely between 21,000 years ago and uh, um, a thousand uh, years ago, uh, there were differences or shifts in distribution 
regarding the northern type and the southern type, you know? So this depended in big to, uh, depend upon big climatic changes, uh, for example, glacial and interglacial period. Either way, one type of caribou or reindeer was expanding sometimes and the other shrinking uh, 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 and vice versa here. Now, there is a link between climate stability and distribution of caribou and reindeer. So when we model this to the next 70 years, so until 2080, um, I, I guess 65 years from now, we see that we have the climate which is most stable in the north and most unstable in the south. And this is concurrent to the fact that we might see problems with caribou in southern Canada. The climate and the habitat conditions will be most unstable in the next 70 years in southern Canada and this is where most biodiversity will be lost. So to recap, and again you have that in your document, climate and habitat has changed historically. Uh, caribou and reindeer responded during the last uh, 21,000 years. In the next 70 years, caribou habitat will be unstable in southern Canada, and woodland caribou is predicted to decline uh, uh, then. And add to all this other human impacts, which is already something that came up in this conference so far. So we should be concerned, yes. Let me now switch to the second paper that we published this year. So we model um, uh, caribou uh, survival. We have caribou survival probability in the summer period and in the winter period because they are selecting different things in summer and, uh, and winter depending upon habitat quality and uh, the predation risk. Of course, you see that uh, we have uh, a number of curves here. For example, this uh, uh, black curve is, again, for the summer, and it is uh, likely survival probability um, with good habitat and low predation risk, and you will see the survival probability is high, right? And still, with good habitat and high predation risk, survival is fairly high, which basically poses the question to you all. Should we invest our effort into having a better habitat or into killing all the wolves and having a lower reputation risk? It's a big choice. I'm not making this choice, trust me. And I think that the people who should make the choice are the Canadians or the Albertans. And the people should know that we have still a choice. Okay, and what happens is that, um, of course, with poor habitat, and high risk, boom, there is a collapse in uh, caribou survival and likely decline and extinction. And uh, with uh, uh, poor habitat and low predation risk is what we're managing for now. So still, there is a low survival probability, and this is what we're doing now. We're killing many wolves, so we are dramatically decreasing predation risk, and we're not doing much for the habitat. So this is where we are. So, of note here is that uh, survey, survival of caribou depends upon habitat uh, and also human impacts, of course, which in this model were included. For example, density of cut blocks and, and seismic lines, and interplay with predation. Yes, and uh, again, speaking uh, about uh, uh, habitat, predation, and survival, we have made and published, even in 2014, some uh, habitat suitability maps, some predation risk maps, and then we have modeled survival probability for caribou, obtaining this uh, pixel resolution images that are usable to, by industry, because they are very fine scale, or more likely contours of uh, survival probability at the landscape level. Either way, the point I want to make here is that these spatially explicit products 
are particularly useful to industry when you must decide if you are going to place a well site here or here. Very likely you might decide to put it uh, where there is not a low survival probability of caribou already. Now, the reason why I say this is because it happened. It happened. I was very pleased to know that it happened. Um, I don't want to say to, to which oil and gas uh, a, a industry, but it happened. Often times, there are a number of options that depend upon the geophysicist's advice or where there is higher or lower risk with regard to the underground product that you get there. And you have to make decisions. So our maps and our papers can help you make a decision. Please contact us. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, Gordo spoke about lambda, which is basically the growth uh, uh, rate for grizzlies in his case. And we can speak about uh, all this project into models establishing population trends in the future. So this is the theoretical framework. And practically, we can project on the landscape areas uh, where there will be likely a um, increase and areas that will be likely experiencing a decrease on the caribou population due to habitat and predation risk. So basically, we can predict population uh, trends, which is the information that is important for regional planning. And now that we have a land use framework in Alberta, that we are trying to plan at the regional scale, I think this is the information that you need. So this is the, the third part of my, of my talk. So I wanted to speak about a behavioral model for caribou as an individual agent. So we can model the behavior of an individual caribou uh, depending upon a number of decisions made uh, um, uh, upon uh, environmental factors uh, also including um, uh, anthropogenic risks. So the model is depending uh, upon what we know uh, for animals and behavior, and also upon uh, a, a base map of industrial features, uh, including um, seismic lines, uh, uh, cut blocks, uh, and basically the attributes are presence and densities of all these features. And also we look at harvest age and uh, well site activity. We know that most of the activity on well sites is at the beginning when they are established, right? Um, uh, basically what we, what we obtain is uh, um, uh, scenarios. And uh, here in the scenarios, uh, you will see uh, our agents, which are virtual caribou, and how they move on the, uh, on the landscape. Now, we also validate this, okay? We look at our virtual caribou if they move identically to the actual caribou. And this produced uh, uh, good results, validated results. So we can mimic caribou behavior. Um, it is published in ecological modeling. It's fairly complex. But the picture that you get is fairly straightforward. It's a map uh, in which you have infrastructure, seismic lines, cut block density. Uh, active wells, and then you have these locations of caribou, which are these points, right? So, what is this useful for? It's useful for predicting the future. What will happen if, uh, in a certain areas, we establish uh, uh, forestry operations or industrial operations? What will likely happen? What will be the movement of caribou uh, like? And you can have a number of outputs and these outputs will also include survival, issue, if you wish. Um, I want to make some final remarks. Um, what we did in uh, 2014 was we kept translating academic knowledge into applied products. Uh, we contributed to determining the genetic unit at which caribou could be managed and preserved. Uh, we gathered and analyzed empirical data relating caribou to human impacts impacts. We also model and predict future scenarios, and we need PTA as partner in the future, too. Now, I want to end with a positive note. Um, 
I also had photos of the landscape uh, turning basically into a chessboard, you remember cut blocks and well sites and roads and seismic lines and so on. But uh, I want to present the photos of a wonderful colleague and photographer, he's called Mark Bradley, and this is our mountain caribou. Um, this is how you really see them from the air or from the land, realistic, you see there's a caribou, you see in these mountains in the back, or uh, foothills areas, and this is at close range. And I thank you all very much.